I think people are, are aware of Vietnamese cuisine and most people don't want that cuisine to change or don't want to have their understanding of the cuisine to change because the cuisine is changing all the time. The idea of a, a, like a, this unifying national cuisine, Vietnamese cuisine, it doesn't, it doesn't exist, really. It truly really doesn't exist. Even a unified Vietnamese identity doesn't exist. Like, it's kind of like saying, like, you know, Italians defined by tomatoes and olive oil. What people see as essential is because they're looking from, like, an outsider's point of view, and it's not granular. Because once you go granular, it's so varied that you can't have a unifying national cuisine. I really truly believe that there's nothing essential about any cuisine. I think, unfortunately, certain Asian cuisines are viewed as they have to be cheap, otherwise they're not good. It's discriminatory. It really is. And that's just by virtue of the fact that, you know, they, when the Vietnamese came over, it was just a particular price point that they had to go on, mainly because it wasn't a very wealthy population. We are using the same produce and products as everybody else in Los Angeles of, of you know, fine dining restaurants. You know, I don't want to sacrifice our philosophy of using good ingredients and good produce just so that it can be cheap. Jose, how are you doing? Good. Are you set up? Yes, yeah, yeah. Are you good? You know about the family table? It's back on. Oh, uh, family table's back on? You didn't hear that? No, I didn't hear that. It is. Back on, okay? Back on. All right. When you're trying to get by, you do it in the most economical way. Are you okay? Satisfying you the most common like palate possible. Already, so and that's not what chefs do. That's not what chefs with a voice do. Okay, Eleanor. There's a difference between having a restaurant for purely survival versus having a restaurant because that's the only way you can creatively survive. Taste the meatloaf too, okay? Yeah. How you doing, Stephen? You know, in the past, I've worked at French restaurants, I've worked at Italian restaurants, I've worked at Californian restaurants. But right now, what I'm focused on is really the food of our culture and being able to share that with as many people as I can. Yeah. Thank you, Norma, behind. My father's side being of Singaporean heritage it was something that I felt was important to share as best as I could, so it made sense. My mother's side is from Hong Kong, which is very Chinese. So with Cassia, there's not only this strong Vietnamese influence, but there's also this Chinese and Singaporean influence that we have. Unlike, say, Chinese food, which has been in the States for so many years, Southeast Asian food is still relatively new. So we have a lot of ingredients and spices and herbs that are still new. And uh, same thing with the Singaporean elements. You know, there's new flavors there, and we want to introduce that to everybody. I think that what we normally get in a Vietnamese restaurant here in the United States, we see a collage of the various foods that Vietnam is known for outside of Vietnam. Um, consider it the highlights version. So you're not gonna find typical Vietnamese dishes at our restaurant. You're not gonna find pho at our restaurant, or at least in the normal way that you would have it in a Vietnamese restaurant. You know, that pot of pho. Is their way of honoring pho in the way that they do best, which is creating the most beautiful, wonderful stock you ever can. Because it's at the essence of pho, is the stock. And so I thought, well, wouldn't it be great that if we took, instead of just 
beef broth, but we would add sort of the spices and the ingredients that you find in a traditional Vietnamese pho broth. And so if you look at it, it's still, you know, kind of a very traditional French uh, dish, but it has these Southeast Asian flavors to it. Coriander, star anise, cinnamon. So we add a little spiciness in there. It's not like a, a very complicated uh, broth, but you can bring out all those nuances. They take techniques and flavors that they know and mix it together. And I think that's a really wonderful thing about Vietnamese food, is we comprise of a lot of different cultures. And I think Vietnamese may be one of the original cuisines that really take in fusion. OK, this is going to be for uh, four people, OK? Four. Go to table three. It really enhances it, so I, I highly recommend that, OK? And I'd love for you to just try the stock on its own, because it's just it's very soulful, and it's really nice. So, good, good. enjoy. My mother used to take all of us, and we used to walk to get tacos. But of course, she would put McMum in everything. McMum is fish sauce, right? Because that's her way of making it better. <laughs> the same thing with Italian food. Spaghetti had fish sauce in it. Everything had fish sauce in it. And that was her way of adapting the food to the Vietnamese palate. Fish sauce is used in so many different things, and we joke around that it's kind of in the veins, right, so to speak. And it adds such a depth of flavor, umami, and there's saltiness too, but that savoriness that you can't necessarily get from other items, and you find it in a lot of dishes. Fish sauce is easy to make, but if to perfecting it, you're gonna pay attention to details. The type of anchovies, the black anchovies, only can be found in the Thailand Bay. Okay, so that is the key. Only in food court. The producer salted the fish right on the boat as it caught. The reason being to preserve the fish from rotting. An Kung is the founder and owner of Red Boat Fish Sauce, the premium fish sauce that we use at Casilla. We went to visit the Red Boat Fish Sauce Factory on Fukuok Island. And I was absolutely stunned by what he was doing. You got me a present here? Yeah. <laughs> here oh my god. It's, it's so really good, good to see you. Yeah. Oh man. stuff we so So, okay, so there's something I, I wanted to show you. Okay. Okay, it's, it's Red Boat seasoning salt that um, we actually use it at the restaurant. Uh, we use it on a couple dishes, right? But I guess the idea behind it is, you know, like Larry's seasoning salt? Mm -hmm. You can put it on anything, put it on like French fries, you can put it on vegetables and right. steak and chicken and seafood. But I wanted to do something with, you know, your anchovy salt that you have, right? So it adds such a great umami character to it. So I was like, why don't we, make a seasoning salt, whatever that is, you know? Yeah. Then I started adding a bunch of other spices in there. There's some sugar, you know, paprika, we have ginger, cardamom, right. white pepper, and it's all kind of like trying to balance the flavors, and I just kind of want to get your opinion. Yeah. Um, so, so it's fish sauce that's basically been kind of dehydrated, and we rub that in there in lieu of just regular salt. So it kind of permeates, and it gets into the meat. But what it does is it also brings out this sort of umami character to it, but also brings out some of the funkiness inherent in the uh, hanger steak itself. We rely on chefs because they know best. They care about the ingredient, what they cook with, and if they find the right one, they're gonna come up with different dishes that can utilize the ingredients. And you see it validated again with these chefs. We're looking at probably rare. So do I pass? Is it A minus, oh A my plus, gosh. a B? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Anything above that? <laughs> When I 
I had graduated college. I was living on my own. I made pho. And I've been, you know, making pho, yeah, uh, chicken pho for a while, you know, before then in college. But it just never turned out the way my grandmother's turned out. You know, when I make a good pho, grandma is like uh, the gold standard. Finally, I said, you know, grandma, I'm just going to get all the ingredients. Let's cook it together. And I see grandma just stirring a pot. I say, what are you doing, Grandma? I just stir it, you need to stir. And I taste it, it tastes awesome. But then I realize in the end, it's, uh, she doesn't know how to explain it. You know, like, it's just like, she probably added, like, a little bit of salt, a little whatever, like, just, you can't cook something exceptionally well if you don't have a good palate. You can just follow a recipe and maybe luck. <laughs> You'll get to, like, a great product. But really, in the end, it's like, you follow a recipe, and then your palate is gonna refine everything from there. And that's why, in the, in the end, my grandparents taught me, it's like, you, the palate is like, that's what you hone. You don't hone the recipe, you hone the palate. So anyway, now I feel like the fall is so grandma, you know? Deep grew up in a, like, a heritage restaurant family. One of the original Vietnamese dining establishments in Southern California, if not America. So she grew up in a dynasty. So for her, it must seep through her blood. But at the end of the day, I think Deep's food is Deep's food. Um, because she's very conscious of what makes her food her food. And she does really honor it being Vietnamese. And she pulls from Vietnamese dishes in California, and then she makes it her own. About to close one of the first Sunday nine, and I wanted to open my restaurant, Good Girl Dinette. Uh, my aunt says, "Why don't you just take over the first Sunday nine? Like, one well, number one, I cannot I cannot live in Orange County. <laughs> number two, um, you know, it's not what I want to do. You know, I feel like I cook best when I'm fully engaged. I feel like if I were to serve the same menu that they have served since 1982, I just want to feel engaged. Like I would definitely be on autopilot." Maybe it's because it was so many years of just cutting on like 50 pound bags of onions, peeling 50 pounds of frozen shrimp. But 79, it's got its own mythology, it's got its own history. I want to build on top of the tradition that was already here, you know, and, and I saw myself as part of the continuum, not as, you know, not as out of step. I just wanted to introduce something else into the consciousness. It's like, Here's this other thing that exists in the cuisine. I wanted to make my own mark. When we would go on road trips when we were kids, my grandma would cook rice. She would take a clean pillowcase and put the cooked rice, and then she would knead it, and she would make it into this log. She would take a piece of thread, and she would cut, like, coins. And so you would have this rice that's compact, but like it's like a, it's like a sandwich but you'd never find that anywhere because it's like it's nothing to write home about in a way. I love uh, Vietnamese Americans who like order it, don't know what it is, but order it anyway. And then the light of like recognition and they're like, yeah, my mom used to make this for me. And so I feel like Good Girl Dinette, we're not really fashionable, but it's like, all the dishes that are in the restaurant is driven by like, a true love for it, you know, um, except for the spring roll. I don't really love the spring roll, but, you know, it's like you got to have it in a Vietnamese restaurant. And I just I'm very resentful. I do a great spring roll, but I'm very resentful that I have to do a spring roll. <clears throat> but, you know, it's a business. So apart from that, everything I like. Yeah, so we have some zucchini here. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I don't hear something. Take a look and see. Okay. Well, you know, I think they're too big because I have the di a dish that I need zucchini that are like two and a half inches. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking. Yeah, that's going to be too big. Like, I love this. 
This is what I want. Oh, okay. I love that it's all fuzzy. Yeah, it's gonna be beautiful. Do you grow any uh, any beans? We're having the, the kids plant beans. Our, our, our aim is to grow uh, French beans. For yeah, me, yeah. the California influence comes in in a dish like the Three Sisters. We only do this dish in the summer. We do like an Italian summer squash, corn, and blue lake beans when they all come to the market. There. Okay. The Three Sisters is my favorite story because it shows how even ingredients and even crops and even nature find ways to protect and take care of each other. Corn, because corn goes really tall, gives a place for beans to go up and squash because the leaves are really big and the squash helps prevent the sun from killing all the other plants. Um, and the beans, because the beans help with the land, you know, the actual dirt in the ground, it gives it nutrition. I really love it and I love Deep's take on it because she takes these ingredients that are endemic to the Americas and makes it her own. So what are these called? Egg, egg, egg plants. plants. Okay, these are egg plants. I think the word fusion has been replaced by Californian. I think it's slowly going from farm to table to California cuisine, meaning it has, it blends different cultures together with the farm to table ethos. California does mean we have an awareness to veggies, but it also means to me, that it probably has different influences from different cultures. That one, one, two, three, up. There you go. That's a white one. Yeah. All right, go ahead. I'll help you. I'll put these over here. Okay. Yeah, sure. So, just, I'm gonna put the onion in afterwards. Should I rub the interior with the salt as well? Yeah, you don't need to. No, I already did. I can't reverse All right, time. That's fine. Sorry, Never chef. listen to me. Sorry, Chef. Never follow instructions. We shall. <laughs> okay. All right. So I kind of gave it a massage already. Yep. My mother was an incredible cook. Everything was fresh. All the chickens we ever ate in our house were always butchered at home. Did you wash the salt off yet? You're supposed to wash the salt off? Yes. You didn't say that, Chef. That's okay. Just so no, what I'm going to do out. is I'm just going to pour it out now. Yeah, that's right. We lived in a six-unit apartment building in Echo Park. We slaughtered ducks, chickens, and yes, we, we had a live pig. Uh, to this day, I'll, I'll never forget how terrified I was. The chicken went upstairs and it never came down. <laughs> First time I went to Vietnam was 2010. So I'm going to put some gloves on in case the health department comes. <laughs> Those bastards. I think the most important thing was I think I started to understand Kim a little bit better and to understand her heritage. All right, and then this. Yeah, more lime. Yeah. Actually, a lot I learned from Kim's family. Before her mother passed away, uh, there are a number of dishes that she taught me and we still use at Casilla. And for me, it's an honor yeah. to be able to carry that on. Are you no, sure? Not, not ready. <laughs> Just a little bit more of this. Just, Just on top. A little bit more. And then. Oh, uh, um, yeah, it's right here. Some laksamis. Here, you can do it. All right. How is the. Is my gesture okay? Yes. Does it look? Looks great. Yeah, you sure. And then some pepper. I'm going to show what's in pepper. We're done. My dad was a natural archivist. 
he always said that we were starting a brand new life here. And so by having the five of us, he was growing roots into this country and that each of us was a new root. He kept everything. Um, this was the original I-94 card. This is the admission card to the United States that let us in as refugees. I've only been to Vietnam three times, and the first time I went was actually right after college, which um, completely changed my life. I went with my mother because it was my first time, and she took me to our village, took me to all the places that she and my dad went to and where my dad grew up and my family home in Vietnam. Our food, our culture, the way that we interact, the way that we talk, everything made sense at that point. Um, but the one thing that will always remind me of who I am and what I am is this Hong Kong Red Cross. Um, it says here, camp inmate identity card number. They called us inmates. They still do, and it's my dad holding up um, his name and his camp ID number. And this was taken at the refugee camp in Hong Kong on August 1st, 1979. Who goes through your head when you look at something like that? Um, it reminds me not to take anything for granted. And it reminds me of my family's history. Um, it really forces you to think about who you are and where you come from. And, uh, You know, and it reminds me of why I do what I do. So. Sorry. One of the barriers, so a deepening understanding of Vietnamese cuisine is that if you only go on what you know at restaurants, you're gonna get a limited view too. But that's, I think that's changing. I also dealt with my family where like the older generation does not want to relinquish control, doesn't want to listen to what the next generation has to say. And uh, thank you, Mom. When you have this breakage in lineage in a way is that the newer generation, we don't get to inherit a restaurant or knowledge or whatever, it gets truncated and we kind of have to build again. It's funny, like, you know how like you, you just think you're not, you're not like those people and then you get older and you're like, oh God, just like those people. I do find it funny, like, I'm, like, doing the same profession as they are. I just really saw myself as a square peg, you know, and then seeing, like, now we're, we're actually pretty similar, you know, in some ways, in all aspects. Uh, I appreciate that more as I get older. There's a big diaspora of Vietnamese people, right? And I think Vietnamese food is different in all regions. If you look at Vietnamese food in Australia, it's different than Vietnamese food in California. Even if you look from the west side to the east side, just because you're Vietnamese and you pull from that knowledge, what lands on the table is not the same dish. The fact that Brian and I can be entrepreneurs and open up our own business, this is by choice. This is not by forced circumstances. We're not doing it to survive. We're doing it because it's a labor of love. It's our passion. We're just trying to be successful in anything that um, we're doing, but we are immigrants. And to be able to hold that up, it, there's a lot of pride in that. And I hope that that influences others or encourages others that, yeah, you can do it. 
So maybe that, that adds to the dialogue in Los Angeles. I hope it does. Um, and then for the future, you know, we'll wait and see how we evolve, how Casilla evolves, and how Los Angeles evolves. I'm gonna be beaten up by Vietnamese people in Vietnam for this, and maybe people even in New York. But I think Vietnamese food is most exciting to me in Southern California. Thank you. We have the freedom. It's, uh, we live in a culture where we celebrate individualism, and that's LA. So I think because of that, it bleeds into food, and it bleeds into culture, and you get to do you. LA lets you do you more than anywhere else in the world.